There are secrets that lay in the shadows of the Great Pyramids, under the watchful eye of the Sphinx. Secrets older than the Pyramids, older than the Sphinx. For the people that live here, these secrets hold the key to the very creation of life, the universe and everything. And some of these secrets can be exposed by looking at three myths from three ancient Egyptian cities, each with its own cosmos from which mysteries of creation unfold. How did the world of these people come to be? Who were the gods that ruled over this ancient land? And what power did they wield to forge existence from before time? Come with me on a mesmerising journey through the myths of Heliopolis, Hermopolis and Memphis as we wander with the cosmic dance of creation as told by the ancient Egyptians. These are their stories of the universe that I hope will fascinate, captivate and transport you back in time. And so, if you want to learn more, then grab yourself a cup of tea. And welcome to Crackenford. Today I'm going to tell you how Egypt began, but not by looking at archaeological evidence, no, but from a mythological point of view. And I will do this by telling you the three creation myths of the ancient Egyptians to explain how they saw their beginnings and how things came to be. The three myths are known academically as the Heliopolitan, the Hermopolitan and the Memphite creation myths. And they are named after the cities where the stories were found, which is Heliopolis, which is located just to the north of modern-day Cairo, Hermopolis, which is also known as Kumon, an ancient city near the modern-day El Ashmunian, and finally Memphis, which is a location just to the south of modern-day Cairo. Now, these myths weren't written down in a book form. They have been collated from clues from various papyri and hieroglyphs written on the walls of pyramids and the sides of tombs, and all seem to have an origin from the period called the Old Kingdom, with the Memphites showing the evidence as the most consistent of these myths, all of which seem to be at least four and a half thousand years old. So, Let's find out what these myths are about and how the Egyptians thought their cosmos was created. And then we can analyse these myths to see if they are connected, their patterns, consistencies, and perhaps a, a common religious belief, or even a common origin for them. In the beginning, before there was sand, before there was sky, there was nothing but a vast undulating ocean of chaos which was called none. It was a time when silence was the only song and darkness the only light. Within this primordial setting, a force began to stir, and so it was that Atom, the All, the Complete One, manifested himself into being. He was the first God, the spark of life amid the eternal darkness. He came into being on his own, born from the depths of the cosmic waters. And when he came into being, so did a hill, rising from these depths in the middle of the nun. And this hill was the primordial mound, known as Benben. Atom made his hill his home, and there on Benben he began his great work of creation. Atom, with a mighty effort, coughed, and from his mouth emerged Shu, the god of air. Then Atom sneezed and from his nose sprung Tefna, the goddess of moisture. These children were the first divine pair, and they brought new aspects of existence into the cosmos. Shu and Tefnut wandered the cosmos, exploring the endless expanse of none. But they were young and naive, and soon they wandered out of sight of Adam and became lost. Adam, growing wide for his children, removed his eye, and sent it to find them. The eye went on a long and perilous journey, but eventually found Shu and Tefnut and guided them back to Atom, and he was overwhelmed with joy on being reunited with them, and tears of happiness flowed 
and those tears landed on the surface of Benben and became the first humans. Shu and Tefnut in turn gave birth to Geb, the earth, and Nut, the sky, and the relationship between Geb and Nut was so close they seemed inseparable, intertwined in a perpetual brace. And this made Shu uncomfortable, and she disapproved of this incessant closeness, and so she separated the earth and the sky. But not before Geb and Nut had four children themselves, the gods Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephis. These were the gods of life and death, fertility and destruction. And with this, the world as we know it today started to take shape. And this is how the Heliopolitan version of the Egyptian creation myth began. We see the unfolding of the cosmos where there are no gods at the absolute beginning. Then Atom manifests himself from nothing and creates the gods, who then create the earth and the sky before splitting them to create a separation. And this is a particularly interesting event, which I will talk about later on in the video. But first, having heard this creation myth, if you fancy acting like a god or goddess and creating something, then you can create happiness by pressing the like and subscribe button. And on that happy note, let me tell you the Hermopolitan creation myth. Before there was time, before there was anything, there was nothing but a vast, silent expanse of void. This was none. The primordial waters of chaos that existed before the world. Amid this infinite emptiness, there was the Ogdoad, the Great Eight, four pairs of deities, gods and their consorts, in the form of frogs and serpents. And they represented the primal elements of existence, water, eternity, invisibility and darkness. There were Nonet and Nun, the deities of primordial waters, He and Hohet, the gods of boundless eternity, Kuk and Koket, the gods of the primordial darkness, and Amun and Amunet, the gods of the hidden and the unseen. These were the first entities to exist, before creation happened, and they persisted in the void, representing the potentials of life yet to be manifested. Then the Ogdoad interacted with each other, and the energy from this unity allowed a mound of earth to rise from the waters, piercing the void. And at the summit of this hill, there was an orb shimmering with unseen energy, and this revealed itself to be a great cosmic egg. And with the sound like the beating of a thousand wings, the egg began to crack. And from it spilled radiant light shooting across the cosmos, breaking the eternal darkness. And from the shell emerged a magnificent bird, its feathers gleaming like gold. And this was Ra, the sun god. With his first breath, Ra let out a mighty cry, and his voice echoed across the void, shattering the silence of none. As Ra spread his wings, light filled the void, banishing the darkness. He took to the sky, leaving a trail of golden light in his wake, and this was the first sunrise. Ra then began his eternal duty, traversing the sky by day and journeying through the underworld by night, creating and controlling the cycle of day and night, the very concept of time itself. But Ra was not content with this empty world, and so, using his divine power, he created all the gods, humans, animals, and all the elements of the world we know today. And so it was then that, under the divine order of Ma'at, the universe began to thrive, filled with life and variety. And that is a creation myth from Hermopolis. Although it is worth saying that another common version doesn't have an egg appearing, giving birth to Ra, but has a lotus growing at the summit of the hill. And when this lotus blooms, Ra is released and the first sunrise bursts into life. But there is a further version that has Thoth in the form of an ibis, 
who brings an egg from the primordial waters to the top of the hill, and there Ra hatches out of it. Although this seems probabilistically to be a much later form of the myth. And so let me tell you the last myth from the ancient capital of Egypt, the Memphite creation myth. Once upon a time, before time itself, there was nothing but a vast, silent ocean of darkness. This was the Nun, the primordial waters of chaos, and amid this infinite expanse, a spark of consciousness flickered into being, and this was Ptah. He was the first craftsman, the architect of everything, and in the beginning, he existed alone, enveloped in Nun's chilly embrace. But Ptah was not content with being in solitude, surrounded by darkness, and his heart, which was the seat of his thought, began to stir with ideas, with visions, with dreams of a world filled with light, life and splendour. He imagined a magnificent universe teeming with gods, humans, animals and an array of celestial bodies, and every heartbeat his visions grew more vivid, more detailed. Then Ptah spoke and enchanted him that travelled through the nun and danced upon the silent waters within it. Each of his words a divine command calling forth from none what his heart had conceived. And as his voice resonated, the darkness trembled and the universe started to take shape. And so he called forth Atom, the sun, who erupted from the ocean of none as a radiant golden sphere, casting away the shadows. This forced the darkness to retreat, and for the first time, Light covered the face of the nun. Next, Ptah, through his heart and his tongue, created the Aeneid, the nine divine beings. He imagined them as keepers of creation, stewards of the natural elements. There was Shu, the god of air, Tefnut, the goddess of moisture, Geb, the god of earth, Nut, the sky goddess, and their children, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nethys. Each came into existence at Ptah's command, a testament to his creative genius. But Ptah didn't stop at creating gods. He also brought forth the laws of the universe, Ma'at, the concept of truth, order and justice, and its counterpart, Isfet, chaos and discord. This balance between Ma'at and Isfet, he believed would govern the world and maintain harmony. Ptah's heart swelled with pride as he looked upon his creation. From his thoughts and words, an intricate universe had been born, a world filled with divine beings, celestial bodies and laws of nature, and soon humans and animals. And so ends the Memphite version of the creation myth, and this version is of particular interest to biblical scholars because of the way Ptah manifests the universe. And I'll explain this more as I walk you through some of the interesting hidden motifs in these three myths that will help us understand Egyptian culture, belief and the influences of these in this region of the world. The ancient Egyptians possessed an intricate system of religious beliefs, beliefs that were vividly expressed through mythological narratives these three creation myths illustrate the diversity within ancient Egyptian cosmogony, as whilst they share certain thematic elements, each of the traditions also reveal different facets of ancient Egyptian culture and philosophy and theology. And so let's look at each of them to understand this further. The Hedipolitan creation myth, emanating from the religious centre of Heliopolis, already gives us a clue to its influence within its name, which in Greek means City of the Sun. And this is one of ancient Egypt's most influential cosmogonies, as within the myth we have the sun god Atom, or as most know him Ra, or even Atom Ra, as the creation god. And thus the myth reflects the significance of solar theology, as well as offering insights into how this culture understood the universe's creation. The Heliopolitan 
myth describes Atom creating himself, symbolizing the concept of self generation. But there are some scholars who also consider this as possibly representing the unification of male and female forms, a twin figure or an androgyny. Atom then goes on to create the Enid, which there were nine principal deities in the Heliopolitan cosmogony. He coughed, spat or sneezed to produce the first divine pair, Shu representing air and Tefnut representing moisture. And to me, it feels like coughing would be appropriate for air and spittle for moisture, but we do see variations. And from Shu and Tefnut, we then see the creation of Geb, the earth, and Nut, the sky, who then became parents of Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephis. The genealogy of these deities can be looked at as natural phenomena, reflecting how the Egyptians really saw the world and the interactions between these phenomena. What we also see in the culture is the identification of Atom with Ra, the sun god, and this becomes more pronounced over time, which reflects Heliopolis's status as a significant solar worship centre. And to Egyptians, the sun's daily journey across the sky symbolised a cycle of birth, death and rebirth, which is central to Heliopolitan tradition. And so we see temples dedicated to Ra in Heliopolis, and these would have played a crucial role in worship and societal rituals. And the Heliopolitan tradition exerted immense influence over later Egyptian religious thought. And we see an expansion of a need to include other deities, and this would impact art, literature, and even the state's ideology. And the result of this was the cult of Ra, reaching its zenith during the New Kingdom, which would be around the mid to late second millennium BCE, which symbolised royal authority alongside a theological unity. The Hermopolitan creation myth originated in Hermopolis Magna, a city dedicated to Thoth, and this creation myth shows a distinctive understanding of the cosmos's formation with Ogdoad, the eight primordial deities embodying chaos and primeval forces. The Ogdoad consisted of four male-female pairs representing the fundamental elements of the cosmos, water, darkness, invisibility and infinity. And within the Hermopolitan myth, creation emerges when these elements interact, which is where we see some evidence of Egyptian thought and understanding as to how the cosmos came to be, physically. This creation resulted in the primordial mound, Ben Ben, rising from the chaotic waters, just as in the Heliopolitan myth. But then the myth differs with a number of alternative descriptions. But the most agreed upon is the version with the one that describes a cosmic egg appearing on this mound, and from this egg the sun god Ra emerged, symbolising the birth of light and order. Now, as I mentioned at the end of my telling of this myth, there is a version where Thoth brings the egg to the primordial mound, and the importance of Thoth in the myth makes sense considering this city, Hermopolis, was dedicated to him. Now, Thoth, which is an ibis headed god of wisdom and writing, played a crucial role in the Hermopolitan tradition, with some accounts of the myth even having him as the divine mediator who articulated the words that brought the world into existence. And so he was seen as the master of divine speech, and so the one who maintained Ma'at, or what we would call the cosmic order. And it is this version of the myth that may have been an influence of later Egyptian and Greco-Roman tradition with regard to cosmic duality, although to evidence this would probably require a separate video. So please feedback on anything you'd like me to expand upon or ask questions if you have any in the comments below. 
and obviously I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. Now the Memphite tradition, named after the city of Memphis, which is the ancient capital of Egypt, is representative of what could be considered a theological response to the Heliopolitan and Hermopolitan traditions. This myth centres around Ptah, the creator god, who can create through his word and thought, something that is mimicked by the Abrahamic god in the book of Genesis in the Bible. And this creation of order through intellect, word and will is in contrast to the other Egyptian myths where the cosmos and its order comes from the chaos. The Memphite creation myth is preserved in the Sabaka Stone, a royal document from the 25th dynasty, which was from the early to mid 1st millennium BCE. And in this account, Ptah conceives the world in his heart, which we would interpret as thought. And so Ptah is showing wisdom through planning, and then he speaks it into existence, which is through word. And we can interpret this as his tongue being the tool of creation, and so sets the divine order of things, or the ma'at. And from this, the deed of creation, things would manifest into their physical form. Now, we can also consider this to be is a theology that seeks to unite various Egyptian religious traditions by placing Ptah at the apex of a, a divine hierarchy, but which then recognises other gods' roles in creation, such as Atum from the Heliopolitan tradition, but which subordinates them to Ptah's will and intellect. And this was adopted by many as Memphis was the capital of Egypt from around 3000 BCE, and so had significant influence on the region. And this theology would have helped legitimise this position. And so now we know the creation myths and their impact on the local traditions of Egyptian culture, we should now ask ourselves, where did these myths come from? Was ancient Egypt influenced by an external source, a mysterious advanced civilization, possibly from the lost city of Atlantis? Or were these traditions started in Egypt? Or could have another ancient civilization planted the cosmogenic myth within Egyptian culture, one that didn't come from a fantasy world? First, it is worth looking at a table comparing the myths so as to allow us to see the key commonalities and differences. And we see that the primordial beings tend to relate to the local culture, who often named their cities after this influence. And this was influential where the myth was told. And along with this, there was a consistent primordial chaos, none. But then we see a difference where we have myths with Atom creating things. We also have a mound growing from the sea. But the myth with Ptah does not. So what does this mean for us? Well, for completeness, I will add another road to this table, touching on the Mesopotamian creation myth, the Enuma Elish. And those with some knowledge of this creation myth, well, then may well be able to identify some similar motifs here with the splitting of the earth and sky. And it looks like there is the most similarity here between the Enuma Elish and the Heliopolitan creation myth. And if you can't see it, I'll explain this all in a minute. But first, we must also acknowledge that through previous research, we know that the primordial waters, a cosmic ocean, so to speak, are consistently found in the oldest and most primitive creation myths. And the forming of a mud mound seems to be a development of the earth diver motif. Now, for those who are not familiar with this, the earth diver is a motif where a figure, usually a water bird, such as a duck, swims on the primordial waters and then dives down to the bottom of the sea and brings back some mud. And when the mud touches the air and the surface of the ocean, it turns into land. And if this sounds of interest to you, this mythology and motif, I'm going to talk about it more in this video on the earth diver and our old creation myths. But this motif is found consistently in Africa, Eurasia and North America. It is a very ancient motif indeed. And so knowing this, the Nun and the Benben seem to be rooted in the earliest creation myths we know. And so are very primitive and are therefore most probably of sub-Saharan African origin. But this Heliopolitan myth 
has this additional motif or Geber nut, earth and sky being separated by the creator. And this is a very interesting point, as this splitting apart of two close deities is exactly what happens in the Enuma Elish with Apsu and Tiamat as a primordial twin, but then Tiamat is killed and split into two. We have these halves that were then used to separate the earth and the sky by Marduk, their chief god. And knowing this, we should ask ourselves whether this similarity is a coincidence. Well, considering the geographic closeness of the two cultures, it seems highly unlikely, but we can probably find more tangible evidence if it is available. So let's ask the question that is, which came first, to the, which version of the myth, Egyptian or Mesopotamia's, has this good evidence where the influence was coming from or going to? And to answer this, well, we know that the written version of the Egyptian myths are older than the Mesopotamian version, and they also contain an older motif, the earth diver. But Mesopotamia was significantly influential in the region, and we see evidence through archaeology that there was Mesopotamian influence into Egypt from around 4000 BCE, and this was when Mesopotamia established the city of Uruk, and we know trade routes existed from this city and between Mesopotamia and Egypt from around 3500 BCE, which was before the sourcing of the Egyptian creation myths. And we also know that when we see exchanges in trade, we often see a trading of culture. There is also reason to believe that the Mesopotamian ziggurats, first built around 4000 BCE, influenced the building of the pyramids. And as an aside, if you think the pyramids are a mystery, then watch this video. But if we then also look at genetics, a paper published in 2017, Ancient Egyptian mummy genomes suggest an increase of sub-Saharan African ancestry in post-Roman periods. It also suggests that mummies from around 3,500 BCE had a high proportion of DNA from the Near East and the Levant region, the modern Egyptians. And this suggests more influence and cultural migrations into Egypt than out of Egypt. And these migrations were from the Near East, Mesopotamia. And so, considering all of this, it does seem probabilistically that the Mesopotamian cultures had a more significant influence on the Egyptian culture than the other way around, and they therefore probably introduced the motifs such as the splitting of the earth and the sky by the creator, as well as having a creator generate a genealogy of gods which would allow the Egyptians to follow suit by adding Ptah as the origin of the gods' genealogy and then applying it to their already well-established and ancient creature myth in the religion of a primordial and chaotic sea and from it a mud land being raised. The Heliopolitan, Hermopolitan and Memphite creation myths unveil a rich strata of ancient Egyptian belief, sharing themes but also having unique aspects, and so they offer us a way of understanding how the ancient Egyptians considered the cosmos. The Egyptian religion, as we know it, started with belief in the afterlife, and their religion and the creation myth at the time may not have changed significantly from the hunter-gatherer populations until the advent of farming, as it contains very old primitive motifs of the earth diver and chaotic sea. But farming came to Egypt from the Levant, allowing the shores of the Nile to become essential for cultural prosperity and essential for trade with the Near East and the Mesopotamians, and the incoming Mesopotamians influenced the region by sharing their knowledge of farming, and along with it aspects of religion and culture, including its archaeology, and all that went into Egypt, influencing the culture in Egypt's capital. And after all, we know it's not unusual for a lesser developed culture to take some of the better religious ideas from a more superior culture. And this would eventually influence much of the religion 
across the region. With the rise of Ptah, who created other gods. It is the studying of these myths that not only illuminate Egypt's past and unravels the secrets of the region, but also reveals the ever-enduring human quest for understanding existence and the cosmos. It is in the interplay of chaos and order, the merging of thought and word, the dance of the gods and elements, that we can find reflections of our own world and musings on creation. And so, if you want to learn more, this is a very interesting video on the connection between Mesopotamian and Vedic mythology. And there are also many other videos on creation myths as well, if you want to know more about those. So, please subscribe to the channel. Please stay safe and well. I want to thank all my Patreons for their support and questions. And this was Crack and Ford.